In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. During this month of November, which is the end of the liturgical season, the church focuses its attention on the last things, death, judgment, heaven, and hell. Today, the subject is heaven. The church sets before our eyes, not this saint or that saint, but the entire court of saints in heaven, the entirety of those who have made it to everlasting glory and who have fulfilled the purpose of their creation. We see the spectacle of the church triumphant, a beautiful place in which there is no sin, no liberalism, no godlessness, no immorality, only the order of God prevailing in all things, everywhere, and everywhere the law of God observed, that law being the love of God proceeding from the face-to-face -face vision of God, which we call the beatific vision. Heaven is, for the Catholic, the ultimate goal to attain, the great reward that lies at the end of a long road of crosses to bear in union with the cross of Christ. Our entry into heaven is the great day which we all wait for. Anyone who is in the state of sanctifying grace would trade in a moment his present life for the life of heaven. Heaven, however, is invisible to us and is consequently known only through the virtue of faith. Faith is that virtue by which we give intellectual assent to the truths revealed by God based on the authority of God revealing, which in turn have been proposed for belief by his infallible church, which he himself established. That our blessed Lord promised the life of heaven to us is clear from many statements in sacred scripture. He said himself in St. Matthew, then shall the king say to them that shall be on his right hand, come ye blessed of my father, possess you the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And St. Paul says, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither hath it entered into the heart of man <clears throat> what things God hath prepared for them that love him. And in the Apocalypse it says, Therefore they are before the throne of God, and they serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell over them. They shall no more hunger nor thirst, neither shall the sun fall on them nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall rule them, and shall lead them to the fountains of the waters of life, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. That our blessed Lord is truly God is also clear from these same Gospels. He therefore has the power to give us the heaven which he promised to us. He has also said, however, that heaven comes at a great price, a price which, which must be paid every single day. And this price is threefold. To deny oneself first. Second, to take up our cross daily. And third, to follow him. These are his words. To deny oneself means mortification. It means to die to the allurements of this world, which constantly tempt us to thoughts, desires, and actions which are contrary to God's law. To take up our cross daily means to daily offer the sacrifice of the sufferings that come to us in this life, either as a result of original sin, such as disease and death, or as a result of our own sins or the sins of others. To follow Christ 
means to profess our faith in him as the true God and redeemer of mankind and to obey his laws. It all sounds very simple, but anyone who is striving for the goal knows how difficult it is. For this reason, we venerate the saints, that is, those who have succeeded in this lifelong battle, this struggle against the forces of our own bad habits and inclinations and of the temptations of the devil and of the world. The struggle becomes all the more difficult as the world around us becomes more and more faithless and immoral. Not only must we row against the current of our own corrupt nature, but also against the current of everything that the modern world considers to be one, to be right, true, good, and beautiful. In other words, the modern world's culture, its liberalism, its paganism, its godlessness, its intellectual and moral perversion, and its debauchery. In order to have the strength to undertake this struggle, and especially to have the strength to persevere in it until our dying breath, the virtue of faith is essential. For it is by the virtue of faith that we see the goal which must be attained. When we drive a car, we proceed accurately toward our goal because we can see the road ahead of us. But if we should fall into a dense fog or a heavy rain or snow, we naturally slow down. We may even stop. It is impossible to proceed toward the end if we cannot see it. And if our vision of it is imperfect, our motion toward it will also be imperfect. This great virtue of faith is also a struggle. God infuses this virtue into our souls at baptism. It grows in us when we exercise it in acts of faith and piety. It grows in us as we pray and do spiritual reading or listen to a sermon. It grows in us as we kneel in adoration before the Blessed Sacrament exposed. This virtue of faith is assaulted every day, however, from many sources. The first assault is from the effect of original sin in us, the darkening of our intellects, which causes us to consider real only those things that can be attained by the senses. In other words, it is the effect of original sin that it would make an animal out of us, knowing only the senses, sense pleasures. The second assault is the faithlessness of the world which has accepted the, this, the, the animalistic tenets of the modern world and of original sin and has made a system out of it. This assault on our faith is especially proper to our age, in which even the natural truths of religion and of the natural law are held in contempt. The effect is that we must constantly fight the temptation to go along with this world of unbelief and faithlessness, which we do first in little ways, then in important ways, until we end up just like the hell-bound pagans whom we have, through little compromises over time, grown to love and admire. The third assault upon the faith is absolutely proper to our own age, which is the present condition of the Roman Catholic Church. In times past, the partisans of godlessness and modern paganism sought to crush the church and the faith of Catholics. 
but it was always possible to keep our eyes on the lighthouse of faith and truth, which was the Pope of Rome. Never in the past were Catholics deprived of his voice. Today, however, we witness with our own eyes something which would be a terrible nightmare if it were not so real in our experience. It is the election to the papacy of persons who have lost the Catholic faith and have substituted in its place a false and dogmaless Christianity, which is now embracing divorce and remarriage, fornication in the form of living together outside of marriage, and sexual perversion. We just saw this past week that Bergoglio called for the civil, the, 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 the recognition by the law of civil unions of sodomites. What other proof do we need? The very sin that invited fire from heaven down upon the sodomites is now according to him, the object of law. All law is a reflection of the eternal law of God. And to ask law to put a blessing upon those evil unions is a blasphemy. For the time being, the lamp of this lighthouse is burned out, that is, the Roman pontiff. We are adrift in a great and dark ocean of error, and our only charts are those of the teaching of the church from her glorious past. Just as the mariners of old would point their instruments toward the stars for guidance in the vast ocean, so we look to the ancient beacons of the church's teaching to know where we should be and what direction we must take. Despite the assaults upon our holy faith, we, by the grace of God, persevere in the knowledge of things invisible and in the knowledge of the life of the world to come. Just as God remains forever the same, so his faith remains forever the same, so his church remains forever the same, so we remain forever the same in the profession of the same doctrines which have been held and believed by all those who now behold the face of God in heaven. The Vatican Council of 1870 declared, for the doctrine of faith which God has revealed has not been proposed like a philosophical invention to be perfected by human ingenuity, but has been delivered as a divine deposit to the spouse of Christ, meaning the church, to be faithfully kept and infallibly declared. Hence, that meaning of the sacred dogmas is perpetually to be retained, which our Holy Mother, the church, has once declared, nor is that meaning ever to be departed from under the pretense or pretext of a deeper comprehension of them. And Pope Leo XIII said, history proves clearly that the apostolic see to which has been entrusted the mission, not only of teaching, but of governing the whole church has continued in one and the same doctrine, one and the same sense, one and the same judgment. It is because of this necessity of remaining always the same that we refuse the, to the modernist inhabitants of the Vatican the title of Roman Pontiff, since they precisely are attempting, in the supposed name of the authority of Christ, to impose upon the church a new religion which lacks sameness with what has gone before it. 
this sameness of doctrine, of liturgy, and of essential disciplines is essential to the Roman Catholic Church. Without it, it would lose all of its credibility. Just as the water that you drink every day is the same and must be the same, so the dogmas, the disciplines, and the sacred liturgy of the Catholic Church must remain the same. No one is looking forward to death as an event. It will be very unpleasant. Inasmuch as it is the separation of two things, body and soul, which are intimately bound together. Think of ripping a bandage quickly from your skin. No one is looking forward to his particular judgment. Since we do not know how God truly sees us. And we are well aware of the faults in us, in us which, despite many confessions and good intentions over the years, still seem to persevere from day to day, from week to week, and from decade to decade. But we are all looking forward to what lies beyond death and the particular judgment. For if we die in the state of grace, we will be in a place in which God's order prevails. For even for even purgatory, if that should be our lot for a time, although it is replete with suffering, is nonetheless a society of people who are in the state of sanctifying grace, who love God above all things, who cannot sin anymore, and who are certain of their eternal salvation. God's law and God's order prevail in purgatory. In all of these things, it differs from hell. Indeed, the only thing it has in common with hell is suffering. If God should take us immediately to heaven, which will be the case if we have the helps of the church when we die and the proper disposition to receive these helps, namely extramunction and Holy Eucharist, the apostolic blessing, remitting all temporal punishment due to sin. If the priest is there and you have the proper dispositions, you go straight to heaven. If so, our dying day will be a day of joy, happiness, and rejoicing. The sufferings of this life and even the throes of death will seem like nothing in comparison to the great and everlasting joy of heaven. It is this great goal, this destination of everlasting life, which today we celebrate. The future life with God, which defines everything we do, we say, and we think as Catholics. The vision of eternal life this faith in the words of the Redeemer is so powerful in us that it has driven all the great saints to heaven. Whom we contemplate today, driven them to the heights of virtue and excellence which surpasses all human understanding. This vision of eternal life is the foundation of the fortitude of the martyrs, of the chastity of virgins, of the firmness of the doctors, of the love of God in the confessors. It fires all of the glory of the church. It is the soul of mortification. It is the sentinel against temptation. The vision of the saints in heaven before the throne of God shows us everything that we live for, die for, 
and hope for. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen.